Hi, everyone. So it's great to be here. Um, just a quick question to the audience. Um, who here has heard of Bitcoin? Who's heard of blockchain? Who's bought Bitcoin? <laughs> Why haven't you retired yet? No, OK, sorry. It's my favorite questions for everybody. Um, yeah, just a, a warning as well. It's actually an Australian accent, so my apologies if you're hoping for a British one. Um, <laughs> so. Um, as always with universities, I must uh, tell you who my partners in crime are. Um, the idea of Datanet uh, was actually originated through something called the GovTech Labs at uh, UCL. And uh, the CEO of that is Zainab. And uh, Professor Philip Trelevin is a, a very well-known uh, computer scientist. And he's the sort of architect of these kind of ideas. And we're driving his, his plan forward. So why care about blockchain? So for me, blockchain is as disruptive to the telecommunications industry as the iPhone was. Uh, so a little bit of uh, personal history about me. I worked for over 15 years in telecommunications. And when I was a lot younger than I am today, I spent a lot of time trying to convince my leadership in the company I was working at that the iPhone was actually going to decimate the service layer of the industry. Unfortunately, I was proved right. And unfortunately, they didn't really listen. <laughs> so I think um, blockchain actually can also have just as big an impact if we ignore it in the telecommunications industry and don't think take it seriously. It can also actually reduce the costs of core network and infrastructure in quite surprising ways. And so it, today I'm going to give two different examples. One is the very long-term perspective of what we're doing in the research institutions. And the second one is uh, the second part of the uh, um, presentation is a little bit more about what we're doing closer to term with a couple of operators. So basically, for me, blockchain is a fundamental transformation of how our customers are going to behave and how we are also going to be able to create new revenue streams. So what is a blockchain? It's, a, it's an interesting question, and it's uh, one that actually you will get a lot of different answers to, uh, depending on who you, who, who you ask. But basically, for me, a blockchain allows untrusting parties to co-create a historical transactional record without relying on a central authority. Uh, the other thing to note is that blockchain and distributed ledger are often used interchangeably. For me, they're not exactly the same thing, but I'm a, an academic, so I'm a little bit anal about these kind of things. So blockchain, however, is a lot bigger than Bitcoin. When we talk about blockchain in a variety of dis different fora, we often seem to have this, uh, you know, this idea that it's about cryptocurrencies only. And in 2008, um, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto released this paper on Bitcoin. And what that did was release two things. One was the idea of cryptocurrencies, and the other was the idea of this, this concept of a blockchain. And if we think about it, a distributed ledger is merely just a platform upon which various applications can be built, and that goes far beyond financial services. So here we have the blockchain as a, a platform at the bottom. We have a bunch of different types of records, currency, assets, contracts, data, and peer-to-peer. -peer. And we can see that Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency are really only uh, on, on the two on the far right-hand side here. It touches on supply chains, digital rights management, insurance, uh, financial securities, everything uh, really could be affected by blockchain. However, be very careful because it, it might take a lot longer than everyone is telling you. We have a lot of people coming into our offices saying that we're going to redefine the future of, I don't know, transport with our new token. Um, and quite often, you know, at the end of the day, those solutions are really quite uh, small in comparison to the size of the problem of transport. So what do we mean by a central authority? If we think about today's world, we have the bank, we have lawyers, uh, we have real estate agents, and we have the firm. The idea here is our society for the last sort of 100 odd years has been defined by intermediaries. It's been defined by um, a set of social norms whereby we outsource trust to a third party uh, in order for our system to work. So, for example, Bitcoin, the idea was that we would replace the central bank. Every individual is able to create their own, or sorry, use their own currency, store it, and exchange it with each other in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion without needing a bank to create the trust. So if you think about the British pound uh, or the euro, um, if you look on, on the British pound, it says the Bank of England, and that is the institution that has provided trust in that currency. 
for however long it has existed. And the idea with Bitcoin is you no longer need that. Other areas, however, are, for example, law. We have a huge number of lawyers or legal firms coming into the center and basically saying, you know, we've got a big problem here because bl blockchain means that we can have things called smart contracts. So we can move our business model from a per hour basis to a per piece basis, which of course scares a lot of lawyers because it's going to make them a lot poorer. <laughs> basically. I'm not so sure I'm worried about that, but, uh, you know, if you think about a, a law firm, the contracts um, between companies are set up by legal firms, and if you can remove a lot of that work using a blockchain by a shared transactional record, well, actually, that does have a big impact on the way that you would establish contracts. The, one of my uh, uh, colleagues from Imperial College was extremely interested in trying to put blockchain, um, sorry, put uh, title deeds of houses onto the blockchain, mainly because he'd ended up in a dispute about who owned his house. <laughs> uh, so he would like to put all of the title deeds of, uh, you know, your, your house onto the blockchain. And the idea, of course, is there you remove the intermediary of the real estate agent, you're able to do things like do uh, title deed searches much more quickly. And the final one uh, is the, the firm itself. So corporations uh, have you know, will uh, have the boundaries of the firm sort of quite dramatically reduced. But that's a lot more esoteric. So very simply, if we think about it, today's transactions, we have separate ledgers in each institution with no oversight. And there's a high risk for human error and fraud. We have paper-driven processes that create delays and errors, and a dependence on intermediaries to ensure trust, which increases transaction costs and time delays. So an example of this, um, that we, we saw previously, uh, released earlier this year, was a uh, proof of concept released by PCCW Global and Colt, where they looked at um, their uh, remittances based on voice, um, voice traffic and implemented a blockchain solution in order to remove the uh, heavy burden of paper-driven processes in that. Uh, and they, they proved, well, they didn't prove it, but they um, estimated that they save over 1,600 man-hours a year um, just by doing their transactions using a blockchain. So the previous, um, previous generations of digital technology have really been about data and information. So IoT is about you know, getting more data, more information. Uh, and basically about how to exchange it faster and more securely in pretty much the same way that we've been doing it before, but with the same sort of boundaries of the firm. The idea has been apply IT to do the same business processes just faster. Tomorrow's transactions, the idea is you would use a shared single ledger between different companies. Records are added, uh, sorry, can't be added without every single party agreeing to those uh, transactions being added and the records can't be changed. So that's one of the fundamental pieces of the blockchain. You can't change a record without all of the parties agreeing to it. Uh, there's a reduction in paper-based systems and a reduced potential for fraud. So the idea is um, apply the IT to completely redefine business processes. What does that actually mean in practice? If anyone wants to actually build a blockchain, or has done so, has anyone actually tried to build some blockchain solutions? Has anyone actually tried that? No. Wow. OK, so you've read about blockchain, but you haven't actually tried anything. Fair enough. OK. I'm about to um, blow your mind in a bit then. OK. Um, <laughs> so uh, what, what happens is, so for example, it's completely outside of telecommunications. If you look at the insurance industry, we did a proof of concept for them, looking at how you could use blockchain to reduce fraud uh, and reduce paper-based processes. And what happened there was, the first thing you had to do was get every single company in a room, and every single company had to bring their lawyer, because they were sharing business data between one another in a way that had never been done before. So this is what we mean about the boundaries of the firm are changing. Companies share data that they have never shared with one another before. The other thing that had to happen, which may be um, interesting, <laughs> uh, depending on how the telecommunication industry progresses, is that the regulator had to be in the room, because obviously insurance is a very sensitive uh, topic, and they had to make sure that there was no antitrust issues. So 
redefining the boundary of the firm, sharing information between different corporations gives you potentially anti antitrust problems. So they wanted to make sure what data was being shared, there was no pricing information, and that it wasn't detrimental to the end user consumer. Just something to think about. So lots of different types of distributed ledger. So um, that is one thing to, to really be aware of when people are coming in to sell um, sell things to you. There's more than one different type of distributed ledger. As an institute, we, we aren't you know, bound to any particular type. There is just a, a spectrum of them. Um, we have, for example, here, blockchain, which is what most people in public refer to as blockchain, which is Bitcoin and Ethereum. So they are public, permissionless, and shared systems. So what does that mean? If everybody in this room is a network node for Bitcoin, so pretend you're a computer for a second. Every single uh, one of you uh, ha records every single transaction. So if I want to give 10 pounds to the person sitting just here, every single one of you records that. I'm, well, 10 Bitcoin. I'm very generous. I'm going to give you 10 Bitcoin. <laughs> um, every single person in the room would record that transaction. Um, what that also means is anyone can read the transactions and anyone can join the network and there are no boundaries on that. In order to ensure that, you have to have quite a lot of complex mathematics at the bottom, which I haven't gone into today, but if anyone would like to discuss proof of work, come and see me afterwards. Um, but you also have other types, which are permission private shared systems, and that's a lot more about enterprise types of blockchain. So as uh, uh, was mentioned, we have Hyperledger. And that means you have to be whitelisted to get access to the system, whitelisted to read and write, and you have to have permission to read the transactions as well. So you, uh, you know, and then there are hybrid systems which allow you to do a bit of both. So in the final few minutes, I was just going to talk to you about blockchain and networking, and this is a very long-term view. Uh, we, we've started a program at uh, UCL called DataNet, which is looking at how we would reform or recreate certain aspects of uh, digital technologies for um, the data world, if you will. So the idea um, is that with regards to data, we're really at the same st stage of the internet, or sorry, we're really at the same stage of development as we were in the early days of the internet. And the idea is that blockchain can address some of these issues. So data, if you think about it, is having a pretty dramatic impact on national and international seats of power. This is a very complex slide. I'm not going to go into great detail, but this is some of the political economy behind what we're doing. Um, data is transforming government. It's transforming financial institutions. It's transforming industry. It's transforming even research. So. And we have this idea of a double-edged sword. So um, my personal data is quite often being used uh, in ways that I probably wouldn't agree with or wouldn't like uh, by very large companies. And uh, financial institutions are being fundamentally challenged and governments are struggling with potential manipulation of information sources. That's the political context of what we're looking at. This is the digital or the, <laughs> the, the architecture of what we're looking at. Um, and the idea is, how do we give people access to the data, their own data, in the same way that we give them access to the internet, but give them control over it, rather than um, solely relying on uh, corporate entities to take care of it for them? So we have a couple of different layers here. Firstly, the idea of a data vault or data banking. This is quite a common idea, actually, in the blockchain space, whereby I would have my data, all of my personal data is owned by me, and I give people permission to use it. So you can pay me for access to my personal data. Um, we then have this idea of a, an infrastructure layer, a blockchain-enabled infrastructure layer, where we're looking at identity management, uh, personal data, uh, for companies and clients as well. So it's the access layer um, that we're very much looking at building. And the idea is that on top of that, we have this idea of a, a universal services layer. Obviously, security is an unavoidable uh, issue that we, we will deal with, but I'm leaving that to the side for the moment. Um, the universal say, uh, services layer allows us to build a new form of uh, uh, new, new industries on top. 
some of these are the data banking sector, so this idea of buying and selling personal data. The other one is e-services, so law, for example, would be able to uh, completely be redefined how uh, they deliver legal services. Government sector and research sector, the idea is you could think of this as akin to a sovereign wealth fund, but it's a data wealth fund. So we're completely redefining how our society and our economy would function based around data. So like I said, this is a very forward-thinking uh, piece of work. So how are we going to do this? We have uh, the idea of uh, a data net which basically gives us ID, identity, privacy, trust, using a form of a universal data locator, which provides extensible addressing to all private data. And as I said, the idea is we're going to create uh, new industry sectors. We then are going to build universal data infrastructures. Um, and the idea, obviously, we build on top of the existing internet, but we're going to have addressing security and permissioned access, and then um, some dynamic trust rating systems. And this is the uh, technology stack so far and the protocols. So we're working with a number of other universities, and if anyone else uh, would like more information, you know, you're very welcome to, to call me afterwards or talk to me afterwards. But let's look at a near-term view now. And this is some work that I've been doing with Colt, um, with the wholesale telecommunications provider. Uh, and they've done quite a, little, uh, quite a bit of work around looking at um, blockchain for remittances. We've also been looking at using blockchain together with SDNC. And this is actually going to be released, I believe, at MEF in November. Um, the idea is, you know, how do you in a world, well, in a world where the uh, uh, internet or the telecommunications providers have moved to SDN, we have an issue associated with the SDN controllers, namely that there is going to be a lot more of them than we previously had. And negotiating the contracts associated with the SDNs or SDN um, interconnects are going to be a lot more complicated. And they'll have to be done dynamically because we just can't, as an industry, afford to have everybody go out and negotiate and sign contracts as we do today. So very much today, this is all done manually. Um, it's a great job, by the way. Uh, you basically start in Hawaii, and you move around all the really nice uh, um, uh, locations across the world negotiating contracts. So I guess there's going to be a little bit of pushback on that, but, <laughs> uh, but it will save the, the companies a lot of money. The other one that we've been looking at is blockchain as an orchestrator. Um, I know that's quite a dangerous thing to say in a room full of people who are looking at ONAP and, and very similar things. But we've been looking at, uh, at this is, you know, how do you use a private permissioned ledger in order to potentially uh, monitor networks and automate, automate that connectivity and automate the, some of the signaling and reduce some of the network complexity? Um, and that's pretty much what we see here. Effectively, we have a smart uh, contract-enabled DLT with policy fulfillment, control, and usage. And we're using the event triggers on Hyperledger, for example, to, to see if we can actually use that instead of going with a large-scale orchestrator. Um, results are mixed, I'll be honest, <laughs> right now. So, um, and, and this is very much a piece of research that, that we've been looking at. The other one that seems to be getting a lot more interest as well is this idea of blockchain and some of the mobile edge cloud applications. So you can think of a situation where you may want to do a transaction on the edge, and it will take too much time potentially to record that transaction and the financial aspects of that transaction back to the centralized cloud. So the idea is we use some of the offline aspects of blockchain. We record it locally on the edge as it happens. And then we um, basically, at another point, sync back to the centralized servers and the centralized um, OSS BSS systems, basically in order to provide a record that prevents you know, contention over billing. Uh, it's really that simple. Um, so the idea there is that it reduces complexity and delivers quite a bit more flexibility across, across the network. Um, and that one seems to be working relatively well. Um, the final one that I will talk about is data supply chains. So as we move to a data world, we are looking very much at something that we refer to in, in the academic world as data supply chains. 
So you know what a physical supply chain looks like. We have coffee beans, they become a cup of coffee. But through that process, you have approximately 144,000 people across the world who touch your coffee, actually, before you receive it. Fascinating uh, physical supply chain. But what we're seeing now is the evolution towards data supply chains. So that touches again on the private data. The data that I produce gets processed and transformed into a new product that is sold by somebody else. Currently, other people are making the money. I might like to make some money off that myself. The issue, however, is that data supply chains give us quite a few problems. We have issues here around data quality, data heterogeneity, and data privacy and security. A big issue could be, for example, in some networks, how do I prove that this data is from the person that it says it is from? How do I prove it's from the system that it said it's from? How do I prove that that sensor that has sent that piece of data has not been tampered with? Really very complex, difficult problems to solve. And uh, one of these was actually uh, related to uh, data integrity in energy networks. Um, this actually came out of uh, a friend of mine um, who I, I studied sustainable development with calling me and saying, my windmill's been hacked, my wind turbine's been hacked. And I was like, that's great, but why have you called me? Um, and they said basically what had happened was that they had noticed one of their wind turbines in the ocean was malfunctioning. They sent their boat out, sent it, um, and the person, when they got there, realized that their firmware was in another language. They didn't know when it had happened. They didn't know what that software was doing, and they didn't know what impact it had on their network. And obviously, that could be quite problematic <laughs> in different types of networks and uh, you know, energy in particular. So we worked together with a company. It's an Estonian company called GuardTime. And we looked at how you would create a blockchain-enabled data integrity solution. So the idea was that we used um, hashes of the firmware, registered those onto the blockchain, and every so often you poll, basically, to make sure that that firmware has remained the same. If the hash has changed, something has changed on the firmware, right? So therefore, you then put into operation your other normal security procedures. Um, what I should say here is it doesn't provide security, it provides an early warning system. So it tells you something's gone wrong, but it doesn't fix the problem for you. Um, so uh, a lot of people say blockchain is more secure or you know, is a secure solution. I fundamentally disagree with that. Blockchain is as secure as any other solution, and you need to apply all of your security uh, around it as, as you would in any other situation. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. And if anyone... Sorry. <laughs> Can you... That, that was very fascinating. I have a couple of questions, though. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> Um, I'm assuming you have a lot of bitcoins and you are going to pay for the next conference. <laughs> well, no, actually, uh, I w I'm one of the very few academics who has not uh, invested okay. uh, because I think it, I, have a, I would have a conflict I'm, of interest. I'm just kidding. So the point here is this is all enterprise. But there blockchain. are a couple of people here who obviously can fund your next conference. So I, yes. I've got the names of the people with their hands <laughs> up. That's right. <laughs> oh, cool. No, so my, my point being, um, you know, this is enterprise blockchain. Yep. Nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Um, from a timing perspective for, for the telecom market, right? Um, we've started seeing you know, the usual hype cycle of, uh, hey, the blockchain is critical and things like that. You know, as we deploy SDN and NFV and VNFs and CNFs, and I mean, there's a journey here, right? Yep. Um, what is your expectation that you know, the operators should, you know, operators and vendors, right? What's the timing expectations, roughly, in terms of when you see this, I wouldn't say becoming mainstream, but at least getting to a point where, you know, pox can happen in an isolated instance? So yeah, I think we're, we've already seen two or three pox happen in the telecommunications space. My question will be, uh, when do those scale up? Right. Okay. okay. Uh, so we've seen the one between PCCW Global and, mm -hmm. and Colt, and actually that's been expanded now to four other operators. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that could be, you know, a very interesting initiative to watch. 
As for, um, so enterprise blockchain, I think, is starting to stabilize. I mm -hmm. think once now we're moving into newer versions of Hyperledger with Sawtooth and Fabric, Fabric they're yep. becoming a lot more stable. Um, and the one key thing that I think is important for blockchain is this idea of interoperability between blockchains. So everyone here will understand the importance of interoperability and standards. Um, and we're seeing a lot more now that there is uh, ability, for example, to build on Hyperledger, but integrate towards Ethereum um, sort of mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. situations. Yeah. As for cryptocurrencies, I always caution people and, and warn people that uh, the biggest problem is not necessarily the technology. The biggest problem is understand the economic incentives behind how you would build a cryptocurrency. So um, I'm both a, a computer scientist and an economist, so I uh, um, work with both areas. And quite often you will see people have designed solutions where the market tends to zero. Something that I would caution the telecommunications market quite strongly about because of the way that you're structured and regulated. So on the economic part, um, if you were to say the number one reason why someone would do blockchain. I mean, we can do everything without blockchain, technically. But the number one or two reason why we would do it, is it lower cost? Is it better accuracy? Is it simplified OPEX? Is it like, what is the, what is the real driver beyond the fact that it's, it's pretty cool? Yeah, beyond the fact that it's cool, yeah. yeah. Um, I would suggest that it is uh, reduced complexity, giving cost savings. Um, and then uh, okay. probably in the next five to ten years, increased revenue. But I see that as a longer term perspective. Okay, so it, yep. it does simplify the operations and the, you know, you do, because yep. you don't have, Okay, very good. That's, no, that's I think, what we're saying. Yep, no, <laughs> I think that's very insightful. Very good. So, Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.